today is 27th of February and we'll record some oral history of three women that were involved in the early 50s, or mid-50s we should say, I guess. So we'll start with Nolene Larder. And Nolene, I'll ask you first, what got you interested? What, how did you get started into this parachuting business? Actually, it was my brother and Graham Knox that got together with Brian Musson to start off the Auckland Parachute Club. And that was in 1953, and they met at our house. Uh, my brother was a top dress dressing pilot, so he went back to Wanganui, and I decided I'd carry on with the other groups. So they decided to hold a public meeting, which they held. And from that public meeting, the Parachute Club was formed with many people instead of just the original five of us. And were you interested in jumping right from the start, or did it just... Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. Pause. So what age were you then? Uh, when the first meeting was held, I was 16, but I was 17 when I jumped. And your brother's age in relation to you, that much older? He's um, five years older than I was. And did he jump? No, he didn't have the opportunity because he was flying down and top dressing out of Whanganui, uh, making up his hours to become a get his commercial licence, and then he went uh, to New Guinea and he was flying out of New Guinea. So what do you remember of the training and, and how it all started? Obviously, you've told us that you were there at that meeting. How long did it take to go from that meeting and all those intervening times? Because I understand, compared with my day in the late 60s, we got in there, and, and today, of course, because they have one-jump courses, but in your case, it was a little bit longer lead-in, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was several months because we all had to learn to pack our own chutes. Then, fortunately, we had, uh, was it three or four... Uh, gentlemen that were red beret and I can remember going along to the hall and them having ropes tied up to the ceiling and uh, having us dangling down and teaching us how to roll when we hit the ground and the correct procedures then we went out to Mangaree and we went off the back of a, of a tray of a truck was our uh, introduction to a little bit extra height and actually feeling the ground and the truck the truck was stationary oh no that was moving <laughs> what speed? <laughs> I, I, I couldn't tell you that. I can't remember, but it seemed fast at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you handle that sort of training compared with the lads? I presume you were the only female at this t time. Yes, that's right. Mm. I was the only girl. Um, oh, yes. Well, they didn't make uh, any um, concessions to me. I had to do what they did, and if I wasn't prepared to do it, then I wasn't allowed to join in. So I didn't mind. I just enjoyed it. And what do you... Um, <coughs> the, I was just thinking the parachutes, you only, did you have a parachute that wasn't serviceable? Is that what you trained with for a start? Because there was some delay in getting the parachutes to start the club, was there not? We didn't have any parachutes at all. We didn't have anything to train with. We just had, um, somebody had got us an old harness, and I'm not sure where that came from. It might have come from one of the, might have been from um, the chap Kiwi, who was the XRAF and he may have gone out to Whanuapai and got us an old harness, but we had no shoots at all. Practicing packing, though, was this something that Brian Musson... Brian, Brian provided uh, his shoots for learning to pack, yes. And anywhere in your group that you were working with, what do you remember that? There was you and... There could have been probably about um, 12, 14, 15 of us, not quite sure exactly. Memory's not quite as good as it used to be. So how many months again did it take to... I mean, you, you practice packing and the landing falls. Yes, and we had to run around the airport and get physically fit. And uh, it wasn't until the... I'm not sure whether it was the end of January or the beginning of February that uh, we actually got a shoot from Irwin's. And uh, then we were able to try and put together a day then when we could jump and uh, I think the first two attempts the days were rained out and even on the day that we jumped which was the 28th of February uh, we jumped between the showers. Typical Auckland southwesterly with uh, passing showers and wind and then dropping? Uh, yes there was a bit of wind about yeah. but yes yes and everybody was saying to everybody now don't wet the chute. Don't get the chute wet because if you get the chute wet I can't jump. 
and I was the last to jump on the day, so the four, we were, the names were drawn out of a hat, and uh, I was the last one up. And so the four, well, the few that were ahead of you were kind enough to land on the land? Yes, they were, mm -hmm. yes, but there were times and days later when uh, we weren't so fortunate. We might pick up on that story a little later. As for the exit and, and the type of aeroplane, you didn't train or go to the aircraft and practice exiting or anything like that? How did you move from your training on back to tray of a truck through to practicing how you might leave the aircraft? Well, we were going to use an Oster air, which we did, and it was just a matter of sitting on the seat and um, putting your foot on the step and uh, hand on the strut, and that was it, and that was done on the day of the jumping. Could you go... I mean, presumably Brian then gave you the, be the guidance of how best to get out there and get in position. Yes, yes, Brian was in the aircraft yeah. with us. So what was your technique of exiting then? What did you do? What do you remember of your first jump? Oh, my goodness gracious me, it all happened so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit difficult. <laughs> I remember sliding around sideways on the seat, putting my, foot on, uh, my feet on the uh, small step that was out there, and then... Um, Brian saying, well, it's time to go, and I went. So that's all I can recall. You don't recall looking back at him or think, what were your thoughts as you were going? Well, this is going to be great. Going to enjoy this. Remember what you've been taught, and away you go. So what was the technique for opening the parachute? Count to five seconds, pull the ripcord. That was all. Make sure you're clear of the aircraft, of course going straight down and not towards the tail. And the ride under the canopy? Oh, I think it was exhilarating. There's no sensation of um, falling, not really when you're under the canopy, you're just drifting down and the ground's getting a bit closer. It's quite, quite uh, incredible, really. Although the first jump you don't appreciate at all. Had you been flying yourself, uh, apart from being a passenger, with your family interested in aviation? No, I hadn't actually been flying myself, but my brother owned a uh, Taylorcraft aircraft, which we used to do quite a bit of flying on, and um, he'd allow me at times to have the stick in my hand, but no, I didn't know so far, so I flying. So the view from the parachute was no different from than from the aircraft? You'd no. been there, done that? Been there, done that, mm -hmm. yes, no different. And the landing? Oh, that was quite fun. Um, I don't recall having any problems. Um, there was a report in the newspaper that I slid down the side of a car, but in actual fact I was in between two cars because the wind caught me just um, a few couple of hundred feet from the ground and uh, started me off towards the car park. But uh, there was no, no problems at all. It was quite a soft landing. And that was on your first jump? The on first jump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about your exit position? Do you remember? Uh, yes, Brian looked after that, did he? Uh, is, did. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And you assessing yourself of where you're going to land, it was quite a-okay a, -okay until that last little... Yeah, until the last little bit, yes. Mm. Yes, yes. I was going for the um, runway quite nicely, mm. and uh, all of a sudden there was a wind gust came along and carried me off, where I really wasn't wanting to go, but had no choice. <laughs> It's funny about that. <laughs> the weather does that to you. They used to tease me because I was so light and they threatened to put sandbags around my belt so that I would go straight down instead of going for a, a longer ride than everybody else. But, uh, you know, that was just the characters in the club. <laughs> they were thinking a little unfair on them, were they? They were getting less of a ride than you. I was getting a longer ride than them. They oh. were jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a good landing, even though you were... Oh, yes, mm. no problems at all. And what about the conversation afterwards? Um, we're so used to hearing first students and their excitement. Oh yes, I guess there was a bit of excitement, yes. Um, one of the first to uh, rush over was my parents and uh, Graham Knox and Peter Dawson and Bill Hope. I was surrounded by these gentlemen and we were all talking flat out and it was quite exciting, yes. How long did it take between jumps then to retrieve the parachute, repack, etc.? Uh, I'm not too sure on the, the length of time, but I know that I didn't go until after five at night. And we'd uh, started trying to go at nine o'clock in the morning, but we were waiting for weather. 
and uh, it was, in, as I said before, in between the showers, so there were, I, I can't recall any uh, specific time. Mm. <laughs> Give them that glazed look otherwise. <laughs> well, we're into take two, and we went from injuries. What else did we start in there, Dennis? Um, well, just about the um, transition uh, from Mangaree to Ardmore, and then... Uh, uh, strangely enough, um, I went out to Ardmore uh, in the 60s and the chief instructor then was Bill Adams. And I don't, Bill Adams was a boy at the same, but he was a bit older than me, mm. at the same time hanging around the Mangri days. We'd sort of worked that out between us. And I think it was Peter Dawson who trained Bill and then Bill who trained me sort of thing. So it sort of went full sort of cycle. But... Uh, do you ladies remember Bill Adams at all? Is there any memory? No. No, he would have been well after. Well after? Yeah. Because his story was that he jumped without static line too. Was he one of the last? I, I don't recall even knowing when the static line was introduced. I think it was at some stage around about the ban, when the ban was on parachuting in New Zealand. Didn't even know the ban. Yeah, there was a civil aviation mm -hmm ban as a result of a meeting with civil aviation that went somewhat awry and the organisation was somewhat dysfunctional and so civil aviation I believe more or less told them to get their act together and uh, come back in six months. So it was, I remember Jeff Lomax often referring to where he used to jump during the ban. And, and how he got around it. Yeah. 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 Was Hobsonville involved in those days, do you recall? Yes, Hobsonville was just before my time, um, just before, I think. Prior to uh, Ardmore, there was um, there was this transition going on because Ardmore at that time had the motor racing on and it was a glider base. Yeah. And it was trying to sort of do the amalgamation of all these activities into one central base and I think Hobsonville was used from about 62 to 64 or thereabouts. Having read civil aviation accident reports from when I first joined, I seem to recall an accident of, or a parachuting death at Hobsonville. Yeah. And I seem to recall picking up from the report some ban or some... It didn't go down well. Very. It was like as if yes. the parachuting people were just didn't know what they were doing and they couldn't be trusted and... Uh, as a shambles or something, or whoever was writing this report or how it was presented, and I thought, oh boy, they really were hit hard. Mm, mm. I think that was part of the reason that resulted in the ban, but certainly the appearance that was put before civil aviation at the time when they were trying to sort it out had a significant impact as well on their decision. So I, I know that well, uh, people like um, Bill Adams and... Um, Jock Fullerton were instrumental in sort of getting the thing back and underway again and Peter Wiley and a few of the other people from further down south and, that, and they sort of got it going and got it up on its feet again. I imagine from when you're talking about the training that your father gave, I guess it was self-evident to him that he was a professional and it was important that it was shown to be professionally done to get the approval and so that when you're starting a club that all the members showed that had good training, I guess. Was that a feeling that you had that... I mean, did Dennis... I mean, sorry, did Brian say that, you know, it's important we do this right or were you just concentrating on your needs well, as was, such? He was a stickler. Oh, he, yes, he, mm. was. he was a stickler for um, training and doing the right thing. No shortcuts, you know. So you obviously resp responded well to the training, you think? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> as far as you can tell. <laughs> Apart from forgetting to count or <laughs> Did any of you have any injuries from parachuting yourself, like twisted ankles, bruised heels or anything like that, that um, generally a good experience? or No injuries at all. I got water on the knee after one jump, but that's all. Just a slight tweak on landing or... The, oh, yeah. and the wind caught me. <clears throat> drag me along the ground. Mm. Edna, do you have any? Oh, I, I had got a few stitches. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got a few stitches. We know about. Um, it was at a, a pageant, and it was a bit windy, 
So they left me till a bit later, but the wind didn't drop. And Brian said out here, right, but there's no way I could come down on the on Mangary. I went right over it mm. and nearly to the water at the other side. <laughs> and I hit a one of those signs that says New Zealand Herald that they used to nail to the posts. And that got stitches in my head. And I never forget the man came running out, screaming and yelling. If I'd landed on his roof, he wouldn't have had insurance. <laughs> Ah, but I didn't land on his roof. And there was, there was Edna's photo the next morning in the Herald, blood splattered, <laughs> bandaged head. I remember the next meeting saying, everyone's saying that's not a good look. <laughs> Did the Herald pick up on the fact that it was one of their signs that <laughs> didn't, didn't accept any culpability as to, as to the cause of this? <laughs> Okay, so it was a fairly safe operation for a number of years, I guess it was. Yes. Yes, very safe. Well, I think everybody was very responsible, mm. and uh, they did stick to the rules, mm. and did what was necessary for their own safety and others. There were a number of ex-military members in the club, I guess. Was that an influence as well? Do you think I the discipline so. from mm. yes. war training and? Mm. So, what are the other characters that you remember that influenced you or? Uh, Left memorable moments of uh, Hark. Yes. Yeah, we've got to yeah. talk about Ted, Ted he was. Ted Hark. Yes. The chimney sweeper. Yeah. Yes. We didn't have the tape. We didn't have the tape. Okay. What exactly. are the safe ones to tell? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can remember one time with Ted. This was down at Hamilton. He had had a few drinks the night before, which was not. Allowed, actually. That was another thing that uh, if you'd been drinking the night before, you didn't jump. But he uh, he'd had a, a few, but he, of course he didn't own up to it. Um, and he'd been up most of the night. And he um, he packed his shirt and uh, he put the cotton around the ripcord like we all had to do. That was, um, Brian always said that if we came back to our parachute, if we'd had to move away for any reason, and the cotton was broken, someone had tampered with it. So Ted thought, well, a little bit of cotton is okay, a lot must be better. So he got this cotton reel and wound it round and round and round and round and round. He used the whole cotton reel. And, uh, of course, when he eventually went up, he jumped out and he pulled and nothing happened. <laughs> and he tugged and tugged because cotton is so strong. And he just kept tugging and nothing happened. So he had to use his emergency, you know, how big Ted was in those days. He was a big boy. He was an ex-wrestler, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so the cotton was still around the ripcord. Well, I suppose it illustrates that point about divided we stand and... <laughs> um, yes. So what else about Ted? I mean, I, I recall meeting him at Derry Flat and thinking, who's this old guy here? What does he know about parachuting? And then somebody must have whispered something and thought, oh, don't open your mouth. He's been around for some time. He's rough as oh, they come. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Oh, you did, yes. What was that? Nine? He had a heart of gold underneath yeah. it all. May have um, given the appearance that he was rough and tough, but he was a very caring person, really. Mm. I saw him over he had what he, call, he called it a um, motel, a great barrier. But it wasn't a motel, it was a shack. sort of a shack, that, like a backpacker's. And <laughs> he went to America, you know, and he came back with an American wife, who he, teetering up the road in her high heels, because he said he lived on an island and had a motel. Well, she only lasted three months. <laughs> 
it. <laughs> um, but he told us that when we went over. Mm. I was associated with Ted from the time I was a child to, to his funeral. Yes. Uh, right the way through, and I think his funeral illustrates Ted. He, Hank, as he was known out there, we carried his coffin down to the beach. That is, this was all his request, and leaned it up against one of the sand dunes and took the lid off. And then he had the steel helmet in there, mm. and everybody had a beer, and they put one in there for Hank in the <laughs> coffin, and then the flies started to arrive, so they put the uh, lid back on and carried him down to uh, Trifina to the low water mark and held him there for a while, and then took him up and buried him and uh, yeah. I think a, a trialender went round the um, um, around the, around the uh, funeral for of the no, this way. Uh, for some 10 to 15 minutes and it was sort of a, a fitting sort of a tribute yeah. to him you know and most of the people there were in either gum boots or bare feet you mm. know well if we're getting noises in the background there's another inspector of the house I guess but I don't know who it is. We'll pause for a moment. So, I get the feeling he was a man of the sea. <laughs> he was a man of everything. man of everything. Yes. But he must have been a man of the air as well. Oh, and in the stories I've heard about the tiger moth and the crayfish and the chimney sweep room being used to try and encourage the crayfish to stay on board. <laughs> now, how much of that has been enhanced, I don't know. But... Oh, no, nothing no, has been no. enhanced. It would be all true. <laughs> Yeah, oh, okay. oh, most definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, it was nothing for Ted in his la later years to, from his um, accommodation over there, to put his fishing rod over his shoulder and he'd carry his bag and walk down to the beach, you know, down the public road and down through the airfield. The only difference was he never had a stitch on. Bare feet. Yeah, bare feet. Yeah. Big beards. <laughs> okay. So did he do much parachuting or was he just like an aviator and round and... He would have done probably 500 jumps, yeah. okay. at least. Yeah. yeah. What about, the, so he would have been in display jumps and everything, you just yeah. constantly at it? Well, yeah, you put Ted in every now and then <laughs> on a display jump. <laughs> he, 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 I remember one time, because he became, like he was a pilot doing his commercial exams and that, and uh, I think he got almost all of his exams when civil aviation started to panic at the thought of him becoming a commercial pilot. But um, at one stage there, he uh, was a jump pilot. And uh, on jump run, the arguments between the jump master and Hank as to where, or Ted, where the uh, actual exit point was, was famous. Oh. Ted always worked out where the exit point should be. And, Frequently, he was nowhere near where the jump master was <laughs> to be. So there was arguments in the plane. And... What about his sense of a, a good spot, though? Was he pretty right on that? Uh, he was yeah. above average parachutist, yes. Yeah. You know, I don't take anything away. And a pilot. Mm. He was above yeah. I flew with him many times. And he was a nice guy, too. Yeah. yeah. A yeah. 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 Just a gruff exterior, but, yeah. 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 Not gruff, just rough, wasn't yeah. it? Mm. Yeah. Well, would you describe him as a free spirit, I suppose? Ooh, that's a bit light. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did your father have uh, troubles in no, controlling him in that sense? Or? My dad managed to control a lot of people like that, and Hank was one of them. And uh, I think whatever dad said, Hank did, you know, so there was no... There was respect there. Yeah. 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 There was, I think, in those more to do with the era, too. Mm. Someone yeah. raised the topic of mm. the military influence yes. in our lives. and. Certainly, you know, when you look back even to when I started parachuting and when you, mm. you did yourself, even though there was a high social, uh, somewhat uh, different than, say, what the military would desire, mm. there was still a strong military and disciplinary yes. influence in all our society, really. A really. respect for authority. Yes. Yes. Mm. Mm. So what other characters did we have? That uh, Did you mention, is it Jock Fullerton, you, a name you mentioned yeah. before? Yeah, well, well, I have only childhood memories of... Jock was still parachuting when I was parachuting, but he was killed shortly after I started. Um, I only had... Yes, he was killed in Christchurch, so I never got to meet him once I started. Was he the riser man? Yes. Ah, OK. Yep. I remember reading that report. Yes. Yeah. 
So what about you women? Do you remember what's your memories of Jock and that sense of... Uh... Oh, he was, he was a very nice person, a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh. Yes, all, all, the, all the chats were really great. Yeah, yes. I couldn't say that there was anybody that um, you could dislike. They were all helpful and uh, really, really nice guys. They were a really good bunch. You felt you were looked after in that sense of... Yes, uh, yes <laughs> but we were a League of Nations. Yes. Mm. So you had a mixture of all characters from different countries? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Danish, mm -hmm. Okay. British. Mm. So how were the British different? Oh, well, Major Thresh was a man of his own uh, ilk. I mean, he was older than us. <laughs> and he was um, um, very British. Very gentle. Very, very gentlemanly. Opposite to Ted. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Evan? The opposite to Ted. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Talk and cheese, you're talking yes. about. <laughs> right. oh, yes. Bill Hope was another character, mm. though. Oh, yes, he was nice. He yes. was a character. Yeah, he, was really he was into his poetry. Yes. yes. Mm. And then there was another one. What was his name? Snow Mason. Snow Mason. Snow Mason. Yeah, he was always there. He, he, I, I think he only made one or two jumps, yeah. but, uh, yeah. but he, he, he just fun. loved... Being there in the club. Yes, he was a nice guy. Mm. John Eben was a nice chap. Yes. yes. Oh. He was very nice. He was 80 on the 25th of this yes. January. Yeah. yeah. He came to the reunion. Yeah. Did he come to the reunion? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. And this was, would you say, John Egan? John yeah. Egan, yes. Oh. Now, I've heard that name mentioned. On oh, the photographs of the two yeah. grey hair. Oh. He was at the reunion. And was he a more pilot or...? Uh, John, no, he was parachutist. Mm. Mm. Was there another Egan that was a pilot or? Uh, could be. Eaton, you think? Yeah, no, mm. it? Mm. Okay. What can you say about Brian Musson? Is it safe to? You've got any good stories? So? <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the stories I know are more or less second hand <laughs> um, that he told himself. Oh, okay. But. Uh, Oh, I, 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 yeah, Brian was a, a legend. Hmm. So what, how did he become a legend? What, what was it, just being barnstorming, yes, he, making things happen? Yes, and I don't know, he instilled confidence in me. Um, he, he was just that type of person. You know, you felt safe with them. You felt you were in safe hands. Yeah. So he must have had good people skills in the sense of like what Dennis was saying before of uh, securing civil aviation, civil, civil aviation approval and things like that. And, and stroppy old guys like Ted he was, um, had a way of... Um, what memories do you have of your father? What, sort of, um, um, what do you tell your kids about their granddad as, as a legend? Um, I don't know whether the, 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 like the memories I have I mean when the kids are, I'm the kind of person when the kids ask the questions I'll give them the answers yeah. you don't sort of I don't stand on ceremony about anything like that but um, my memories of him were that he was was a gentleman um, that um, and he was firm and um, fair, you know. I got a few red marks on my butt a couple of times, you know, pinching money for smokes and things <laughs> like that. But um, he was a worker, he worked hard. Um, and I think he generally enjoyed people, you know. I think, you know, once again, people brought up during the Depression. Um, he was one of six boys, and they were a boxing family, and it was compulsory to box, you know. And mm. I think when Dad started parachuting, his mother went to the police to try and get them to stop him, you know. But um, he sold veggies out of a... Um, what do you call them? The old carts, mm. barrows, mm. Uh, okay. around yeah. Christchurch during the Depression with his brother, and... Uh, I remember whenever my uncle telling me about whenever they come to a place where the dog was there, Dad used to be the one that was sent in, you know, to go and knock on the door, 
to see if they wanted any veggies and that. But they had a hard upbringing and, you know, it was, uh, I think, a sign of the times more than you, anything. From that upbringing, you knuckled down and made things happen because... Yeah. I think the times make the people, you know. Mm. And I think um, the people that came through those years, the Depression and the war and all that, you know, were certainly better for it sort of thing. I think it reflected in all kinds of people, you know. Would power shooting have started without your dad doing it? I mean, who else would have been there that would have made things happen? Was he just the right man at the right time, basically, and yes, yeah. had that background? Yeah. And I think uh, there was certainly, after the war, plenty of people around that would have given civil aviation the confidence to kick it off eventually. Um, the fact that Dad had all the right ingredients, like he was trained before the war by the then professional Skinner, and then he was in the parachute section during the war, and then, um, I mean, it was all there on a plate for him, so he sort of, after a, a while, got permission to um, jump with uh, this flying circus they had called the Flying Kiwis, and uh, do the professional parachuting, and then sort of one, very much man at, uh, at the right time, I think that's what it was. Who took over from your father as far as, well, I guess he was called a chief instructor, or what title did they have in those days, do you recall? It was the instructor, I think. Just basically. the instructor. Yeah. And, I mm. think um, Peter Dawson took over. Oh, okay. was Denny Mayne and Peter Dawson sort of. Um, I've got a cutting at home, was the uh, meeting that when he resigned as... Yeah as chief instructor and uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Peter Dawson that took over. Yeah. yeah. What period of time was this, like 56, yeah, 54. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, oh, I was too, because we went to Aussie. It was early, oh. 50, yeah. early 55. Yes, yeah, just before we went to Aussie. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, so somebody else mm. took over yeah. and looked yes, after yeah. things well. Mm. Yeah. 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 So how long were you in Australia, like, if I was doing that? We were there most of the year, I think. Yes, you were um, there long after I came home. Yes, we sort of went, I think, in the early part of 55. It and was then April. April, was it? Mm. Yeah, and then mm. came back in uh, November, I think, mm. something like that, mm. 55. Oh, so you weren't able to stay for the Empire Games in 56 or anything no, like that? No, I've no. never really got over that either. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> You've had therapy and <laughs> <laughs> counselling? <laughs> We're getting to the end of this tape, and I suppose that's probably enough of a session for today. Are there any other thoughts that you might have or memory that you might want to share or somebody to acknowledge that they've um, been good characters and support people? Or I'd like to uh, remember Peggy Means, who was secretary of the club, and she was jumping in in our day. She was one of the girls. She was a... a a nice young young woman. Now that reminds me, I think you were telling me on the anniversary night of a secretary with yes. the wet parachute. What yes. was the story there? Oh, that was, yes. Um, I think that was when the new parachute had just arrived. And of course there was a, a great long queue. <laughs> and uh, part of her duties was to uh, look after the um, Parachute. There was two, two parachutes, and because she had the both of them, and um, she had done three jumps, I think, at that stage, and she wanted to be the first person in the club to qualify, and so she decided that she was going to take these two parachutes, go out to the club on the Saturday and do the seven jumps in one day. So the first jump, she landed in the mud flat, flats and then she used the other one and that also went in the mud flats and there was two wet parachutes and a long queue of people waiting to use them. <laughs> and uh, she was grounded for a month. <laughs> um, and actually, I remember it was the day I made my first jump at Hamilton, 
Peggy was had come out of her off the bench, yes. <laughs> you might say. <laughs> and uh, during that time, she had kind of lost her confidence, and she went up to do her jump, and she sort of was very nervous and didn't want to jump out. And Brian had to prise her fingers off. She, <laughs> yeah. she had got out and she was hanging there, but she wouldn't let go. And he had to lean out and prise her fingers off. <laughs> but she was fine after that. And I think she went on to become the first girl. Did she not, Edna? Did she? I, can't I think she was the first girl to qualify. Do you remember, Nolan? Who was it? Peggy. Peggy? I thought um, was the first. I think I was the first to qualify, yeah, yeah. but oh. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm not sure. No, I, I, I can't remember. Right. Well, perhaps I'll ask about what was the qualification then? You had to have a minimum of so many jumps. Ten jumps before, Ten jumps before, um, we before the Civil Aviation Department um, recognised you as a qualified parachutist. And so once you were qualified, does that mean you could then parachute anywhere in the yeah. country, yeah. organise the aircraft? Yeah. And yeah. 